with the with the anointing and, and with the worship, there's there's multiple reasons for it. I mean, first of all, obviously to welcome in the presence of God and honour the presence of God. We praise him for what he's done, but we worship him for who he is. So the, when we go from praise into worship, um, then, then we're worshipping him for who he is and we're welcoming the presence of the Holy Spirit. But the other side of it is, and, and this is where the platform aspect of it comes into, comes into it, is that the anointing that comes, what does the anointing do? It destroys the yoke. So there is always a resistance by the powers of darkness to the ministry of the word and what the word is intended or purposed to do. So not only is the worship there to honour the presence of God and to welcome the presence of the Holy Spirit, but the anointing that is generated from that begins to destroy the yoke of the powers of darkness that was there to resist the ministry and the purpose of the word. So it has a, uh, a multiple purpose. Does anyone know, um, as, as we speak, uh, Suzette and Danny on a plane now or tonight? Or? They're on it now. Okay, let, let's pray. Father, we thank you for Suzette and Danny. Lord, we pray for travelling mercies coming and going for them. Father, we pray that because this is a long-haul flight, I assume they're out of Brisbane to either LA or San Francisco. LA. LA, okay, so they've got about 13 hours there. Now, Father, I pray upon that flight that they get rest yes. and they can relax. Yes. As Father been there, done that, as some of us have, and uh, you get off the other end and you, you're just tired. So Father, we just pray for rest peace and relaxation on that long flight. Father, when they get to LA, they will have other internal connections. Father, we pray for good connections, uh, quick connections, Lord, that are there for them without hindrance or without uh, issues or timetable issues. But Father, they arrive rested, relaxed, with good connections, locked and loaded, primed and ready to go, Lord, in the presence of your spirit and the power of the anointing. And we give you all the honour, the praise and the glory in Jesus' name. Now, Father, we thank you this afternoon for your word, Lord. I pray that it is sown into the hearts of your people as a seed and that, Father, as seed, it bears much fruit and a great harvest. Lord, not only to your people here, but Father, in turn, that fruit which is produced in their lives is made available to others that they associate with. And we give you all the honour, the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I just wanted to, um, really this afternoon, probably brush across a few different subject areas and in doing so try to... Uh, uh, have a couple of miracles on the go. Uh, one of them is that I'm actually going to try and stand here at the pulpit uh, instead of walking around all over the place, which will be good news to the camera operator uh, because I'm about the worst enemy of any camera operators. I wander around all over the place. But also the other thing is I, I was preparing some notes uh, for this meeting and I went up with a whole bunch of notes and I don't normally follow notes, and, but now I've got the notes and I've got, I've got to stand here and try and follow the notes. So th this could be a multifaceted miracle over the next 40 minutes or, or whatever. So if you're praying, pray desperately for me. <laughs> <laughs> the Ecclesia um, is not intended, nor was it, not intended now, nor was it ever intended to be um, a passive organisation. When we look at the early church in the book of Acts and, and, and through Paul's letters and so on, it was a dynamic, uh, world-changing um, organisation. 
We are called in scripture in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, around about verse 20, 21, we're called ambassadors of Christ. I don't know whether you've ever stopped to think but or, or applied it in this context, but sometimes you find, uh, mostly in Paul's letters, but also in Peter and John, Jude and so on, but sometimes uh, it refers to Jesus, sometimes it refers to Lord, Sometimes it refers to Christ, occasionally the Lord Jesus Christ. Whether you've ever stopped to think, well, why does he simply, in relation to this verse, refer to Jesus? In another verse, he refers to Lord, and in yet another verse, he refers to Christ. There's always a reason. When it refers to Jesus... It's in the context of Son of God, Incarnate Word. When it refers to Lord, it's referring to his kingship, his dominion and authority. When it refers to Christ, it's referring to the anointed or the anointing. So in other words, when we gathered here today, as 17 or 18 of us, or however many there is, we're gathered together as ambassadors of Christ. And that's what it called, specifically ambassadors of Christ, not ambassadors of Jesus or ambassadors of God or ambassadors of Christ. Now, an ambassador is a fully authorised government representative. An ambassador walks in the authority representing and backed up fully by the government that he represents, he or she represents. And in this case, it's the anointing. The anointing destroys the yoke. This is why the Ecclesia is intended to be a world-changing organisation. You are fully authorised government representatives of the yoke-destroying anointing. That's what it means by ambassadors of Christ. You are a fully authorised government representative, specifically representing the authority of the anointing that destroys the yoke of the enemy. So hence, it's we as an ecclesia are supposed to be a world-changing organisation. If there's any um, doubt about it, I've probably done this before, but let me quickly do it again. This, when the English translation of the word ecclesia is church, and unfortunately, over the years or the centuries or whatever, church has become just a euphemism for the building that you meet in. Um, and, and not a whole lot more than that. But when the original scripture was written in the Greek and the word ecclesia was used, here's what it meant. The ecclesia of ancient Athens is particularly well known. The assembly was responsible for declaring war, military strategy, and electing army leaders and other officials. It was responsible for nominating and electing magistrates, thus indirectly electing the members of the Aragapus. It had the final say, the final say on legislation and the right to call magistrates to account after their year in office. It originally met once a month, but later met three or four times a month. In other words, the original concept of the Ecclesia was as an authoritative governing body, not a building or a place of meeting. I kind of like it was responsible for declaring war and holding magistrates to account. I, I wonder, and I, I, when I start talking about the church or, you know, asking questions, and what, I'm not talking about open heaven specifically or any church specifically. I'm just speaking in the broader, broader generic sense. But given that that is the understanding of Ecclesia in the time of the early church, I wonder if Paul 
or Peter or Luke or any of the apostles or disciples of that time walked into a current church, would they actually recognise it? Would they be pleased with it? Or would they sort of wander around and think, what is going on here? What? what? Well, yeah, what, what, what happened? Where, where did we go wrong? And I, I think progressively, and I, I mean, my opinion for whatever it's worth, I think progressively, when little by little things change just a little bit at a time, almost insignificantly, just one tiny step, one tiny change, but over 300 years, there's been lots of little tiny steps and changes and whatever, suddenly the end product 300 years later is virtually unrecognisable from what actually started out. Now, it says declare war, holding magistrates to account. I mean, how about if the church started actually doing that today? I mean, seriously. And, and with the declaring war, and hopefully on YouTube I'm not going to upset too many, uh, been too many out of shape, but here's the thing. John 10.10 10 says that I came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. The thief came not but to steal, kill and destroy. Here's the thing. The powers of darkness have already declared war on the church. Whether you like it or not, believe it or not, engage in it or not, want it or not, the powers of darkness are already at war with anything that even sniffs like God. If you're a born-again Christian, you are in a war. And if you doubt it, let me give you a an example that to me at the time, still is for that matter, was absolutely staggering, but it will give you an idea, and all of you are going to be familiar with this, of the vindictiveness and the hatred and the power of the war you're in. We all remember Israel Folau. Here's a guy who is a born-again footballer. All he did, his only crime, was to post two verses of scripture on a public platform in social media. That's it. That's all he did. A couple of verses of scripture in a social media public platform. All hell broke loose. Now, here, here's the utter hypocrisy and the violence of the attack against the believer. In those couple of verses, there's about, I think from memory, there's about 11 or 12 or 13 or something categories that it say, says are not going to inherit the kingdom of heaven. Well, apparently, the one who you all know, the one minority group that turned him into a national pariah with the absolute support of a vindictive media, apparently they didn't really care about the poor drunks and liars and thieves and fornicators who were going to go to hell because nobody even mentioned them or cared. Least of all, those who were mounting the attack. But there was one minority group that had such a vitriolic, hate-filled attack as to turn a guy into a national pariah, have him sacked from his job, have him hunted and hounded to the point where he went to France to play football, could no longer represent the national team, despite the fact that he was one of the best, the best on the team, could no longer represent his national team, 
was hunted and hounded and turned into a national pariah to the point where he ultimately just had to leave the country. And they even began to attack his wife as well. And the same group who waffles on at great length, a great mantra about inclusivity, couldn't care less about the poor drunks, liars, thieves and fornicators, they can burn. But it was just the absolute vitriolic attack of one group. Seriously, you think you're not in a war? That'll do me for a war. So we're, 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 we're in a war and we're part of an organisation that needs to make a difference. I'm sort of, from a ministry point of view, uh, when I get on a plane and go to Africa or whatever, I'm fairly, fairly practical in, in what I do and the way I go about it. Truthfully, I wouldn't call myself a great prayer or interceder. I wouldn't call myself a great worshipper. Um, I, I've got a whole bunch of areas in there that I, I would say, you know what, I'm not all that flash. There's probably all of you would be better, stronger and smarter than me in any of those areas. But when I get off the plane in Africa, as far as I'm personally concerned, I'm there to make a difference. If not, why not? And if I can't, well, let me stay at home and send somebody who can. But, but when I go into, you know, by the grace of God, when I go into a town, I want to make a difference in the atmosphere in that town. So when I leave, when I leave, let, let, can we look back and say, yeah, something in that atmosphere, something in those churches, something changed. So in, in, in that sense, I've, I suppose I've got a fairly practical approach. Um, to put it simply, I want to go into the place and kick the devil's butt um, by whatever means necessary. Um, over the, the centuries, Historical oversight of the church has changed fairly considerably. When we go back to the early church, the book of Acts and, and continuing from there, the, the oversight of the church was dominantly apostolic prophetic. Over the time since then, and I think this has been, you know, the 100 mile race one, one inch at a time but it's gone from a dominantly apostolic prophetic to probably dominant pastoral teaching what it has meant is that in, in that transition the perspective has changed so Apostolic prophetic is more outward facing. You have pastoral ministries within the church that take care of the sheep within the church and the well-being of the sheep within the church. But the headship of the church that is looking to the purpose and the direction of the church is more dominantly apostolic prophetic with internal ministries taking care of the well-being of the sheep in the house. But when you look around the world today, the majority of churches are pastoral teaching churches. There's not that much serious prophetic apostolic ministry. Bits here and there, thank God for it. But what it now means is that in every city, the church that has progressively gone from apostolic prophetic to pastoral teaching is now, now focused pretty much internally where 90% you know, of what the church is about is just looking after the well-being of the sheep uh, in-house. We need, my, my personal opinion, is to get back into a place where the primary focus of the church 
is apostolic prophetic outward, while at the same time having internal ministries, pastoral teaching and so on, that are still taking care of the well-being of the sheep. But otherwise, if, if it continues in a pastoral teaching role, looking internally, how is the church or the ecclesia, for what we've just read of the ecclesia, going to impact and have a major effect and influence on the city? Because otherwise it has a bit of a tendency to gather together, have some great meetings and internally everyone and everything is blessed and we have some wonderful fellowship. But, but my question is then is, well, that, that's great, but you know, how is the church impacting the city? I remember when I got saved about 40 years ago, there was, I think including mainstream churches and, and you know, smaller meetings that there was just 10 or 15 or a handful of meeting in schools and other churches that were bigger and so on. But I think then there was something like, you know, 150, 180 meetings on the coast every Sunday. Well, we're now 40 years down the track. I'm not entirely sure uh, or entirely convinced how much impact the church has really had on the city. It's not an easy question to answer because I think, okay, well, we can look at it in one respect and say, you know, uh, just watch the six o'clock news and ask how much impact the church is having, but on the other hand, take the church out and you may have something that's a thousand times worse. So it's not, a, not an easy question to address. The church has a voice. The church has a voice and it should be using it. God only knows the voice of minority groups that are fundamentally anti-Christ, anti-anointing, anti-God, anti-church, anti-Christian. The voice of very small minority groups that represent maybe 3% of the population their voices can be incredibly militant, aggressive, condemning, and supported by an absolute left-wing anti-Christian media, while the voice of righteousness has very little to say. Or, or, or gathers somewhere and Tut, tut, isn't that terrible? But the church, dear God, I, I mean, the ecclesia we've just read had the authority and the intent of declaring war, of holding magistrates to account. Maybe we should go back to the understanding of the ecclesia and, and the voice, dear God, the voice that the church has, should have. We've recently had a referendum on The Voice. Now, as it turned out, the people of Australia, uh, I think the total was about 61 or 2 per cent, I think it was a whisker over 60 per cent, exercised their voice by a vote and resoundingly voted against the proposition put forward by the government. A voice is a powerful instrument. In Genesis, God spoke creation into existence with his voice. We're told there's power of life or death in our tongue. And our voice carries the power of life and death. We're told we can move mountains with our voice. Jesus stilled the storm with his voice. He told Lazarus to come out of the grave with his voice. We're told in 1 John 4, 17, that we are as he is in this world. Seriously? And by the way, when he stilled the storm with his voice and he called Lazarus out of the grave with his voice, that was as he was. We're told that we are as he is now in glory. How much more so? How much more so? Where is the voice 
of the ecclesia in this time and season. I mean, let, let me just give you a quick example. Look, this is just from Africa. This is not about me or ministry or whatever, although I suppose the story's got to include that. This time in Uganda, and, and I was there for about two weeks by myself before Gwen turned up, God had given me a specific assignment about dealing with territorial spirits. And we're going to have a look at that in a, in a minute. But I, the first place I dealt with it was a town called Jinja, which is right on the, the headwaters of the Nile River. And this was kind of new territory for me. I, I got given this assignment, go do this, and even a couple of nights before this happened, it's still like... <laughs> You sure? <laughs> it, it's still like, okay, I'm trying to understand this. I think I understand it. Hopefully I understand it. Well, we're going to go and do it. And... But all I had was a voice. I mean, we, we don't, and unlike various others, we don't go out with guns and bombs and whatever. Yeah. All you have is your voice. But there's power of life and death in your voice. You can move mountains with your voice. Jesus stilled the storm with a voice, raised the dead with a voice. You have the same voice. So I'm standing in the dark on a block of land that they're pioneering a church, speaking into the atmosphere, tearing down territorial spirits, and, and I was told... I mean, and, and I guess this is a bit of a demonic kickback. Like, I'm standing there issuing decrees in the dark into the atmosphere. On the one hand, knowing what I'm doing. On the other hand, quite honestly, feeling like, are you serious? I mean, you're just you're standing in the dark here, you know, speaking into the air. I mean, get a grip. But in my gut, I knew it was right. But all I had was a voice. All I had was an anointing and an assignment that said, do this, speak that. And it was to take down the, the territorial spirit there and to issue a decree and declare that his seat would be left empty for all time as a testimony of his absolute defeat. By the grace of God. But you stand in the dark declaring that in, you know, over a city. And you're like, this part of you wants to go, yeah! And there's the other part of you says, are you serious? <laughs> really? You're standing in the dark talking to yourself like an idiot. But, you know, in your heart of hearts, you know that this is a God thing and it needs to be done. The power of a voice. So how's, how's the voice of the Ecclesia impacting the city and the nation up until now? Might need a little bit of a tweak. The, the thing that is of great concern when you look at the media and then particularly the instances like Israel Folau and so on. But when you look around now at our woke left wing politicians and our miserable, woke, gutless, left-wing media and their voice, the voice of the Antichrist is powerful, militant, domineering and will carve you up as quick as look at you if you try to express anything that is conservative scriptural or godlike values they will come at you like the hounds of hell is it not reasonable that the voice of righteousness should at least be as militant as that if not more so am i going too hard so far 
no criticism intended, just, you know, some questions. Goliath had a voice, a voice that instilled terror in those that heard him. And remember through the whole story, he didn't throw a spear or draw a sword. He did nothing physical. All he did was terrorise them with a voice. And being terrorised by a voice, they hid, they ran. At the end of the day, the voice of righteousness or the voice of darkness will prevail. There's no middle ground. It'll be one or the other. We must understand that it's always within the context of a covenant of grace. It's not about, believe me, it is not about what we need to do or should be doing or could do or haven't done or, you know, a list of do's and don'ts and whatever. It's not. It's about what Jesus has already done. Not about, let me say that again, not about what you need to do, it's about what Jesus has already done. Let me just give you three scriptures, there's lots more, but let me just give you three for the sake of um, putting it into, into perspective. Romans 5.2. Romans 5.2. It says, through him we have also gained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and boast and the hope of God's glory. Let's just pull that apart for a moment. By faith, you have access into the grace in which you stand. The Greek word for stand comes from an original word which simply means to be established or remain fixed in. Sometimes there's a bit of a tendency, not necessarily intentionally, but to leave grace at the cross where we get saved and then start to move on with a focus on what we need to do, should be doing, haven't done whatever. But it says we have access by faith into the grace, the grace, the unmerited, magnificent, amazing favour of God in which we take our stand. We enter into his grace by faith and we are immovable unshakable in his grace because it's all about what he has already done, not what we need to do. It's not about we have access by faith into a list of 25 do's and don'ts and commands. No, you have access by faith into his amazing grace in which you take your stand. That's the covenant we're in. Romans 5.17. It's just a, basically a follow-on from the same thought. Romans 5.17. For if by one man's transgression death reigned through the one, Adam, how much more shall those who receive the overflow of grace, the King James says the abundance of grace, and the gift of righteousness reign in life through one Messiah Yeshua, Those which, not those which have a list of 25 commands and do's and don'ts and should or shouldn't or whatever. No, just those that receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life. The word reign there is basilau. Any, anywhere else in the Gospels and through, through um, uh, Paul's letters and so on where you see the word kingdom, 
It's a Greek word, basil, basilo, or basileria, and it means king, kingly dominion and authority. So when it, the, when it said repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, it's never talking about a location. Nowhere anywhere in the New Testament when that word is used, and it's used about 154 times in the New Testament, it never, ever, ever refers to a place. It always refers to kingly dominion and authority. This word here, reign, instead of basileria, which is kingdom, it's basilau. It is actually derived from exactly the same word. So here's what it means. When it says, those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life, it means kingly power to govern, to exercise the highest level of influence to control. Let me say that again. To those, not who try to adhere to a list of commands and do's and don'ts and whatever, simply those who receive the abundance of his astonishing, amazing grace and the gift of righteousness, they shall in life exercise kingly power, royal dominion, the highest level of authority and influence shall govern and control in life. Not because of a list of do's and don'ts, but because of his astonishing, amazing grace and the gift of righteousness. The church today looks for the manifestation of signs and wonders. Might I humbly suggest, just from personal experience, a um, little bit few and far between, a little bit thin on the ground in most churches today. Have a look at Acts 14, verse 3. Acts 14, 3. Long time, therefore, abode they speaking boldly in the Lord. So it's actually talking about preaching. So they stayed there for a long time, boldly speaking in the Lord, who gave testimony unto what? Unto the word of his grace and granted signs and wonders to be done by their hand. In other words, they boldly spoke preaching the word of his grace. And as they preached the word of his grace, the Lord himself gave testimony and signs and wonders because of the word of his grace. So we need a voice. We need a bit of militancy in the church. And we need to understand that it's all within the context of grace. Under grace, we're here to enforce what Jesus has already done. We're not here to act independently. Jesus came and spoke to them in Matthew 28, 18, saying, all authority is given to me in heaven and earth. The cross was never about power. It was always about the restoration of legitimate authority. Because Adam had lost legitimate authority, and Jesus sometimes referred to as the second Adam. The first Adam had lost legitimate dominion and authority because remember uh, when he fell, they kept the blessing but lost the dominion. So the cross was always about the restoration of the legitimacy of the dominion. So everything that Adam lost, Jesus re restored, and we now function as his ambassadors ambassadors on earth. Remember, the devil is sometimes called the god of this world. Put that in context. The devil is not the god of this planet. Not what it means. 
It means he is the God of this broken world Babylonian system. But he is not the God of this planet. Because Jesus said all authority, all authority in heaven and where? Earth, this planet, is mine. So if Jesus has it all, the devil has, my maths is not that good, but I, I just had a reasonable punt, I would say if Jesus has it all, the devil has um, none. zippity doo da, zero, nada, zip, that, that would be around about it. So understand, when the, when the devil tries to assume, demand, press, deceive, whatever, into a place of authority and to exercise authority, he actually has how much? None. Zero. Nada. Zip. That's right. The only authority he exercises is rebellious authority. Yeah, that's right. So he acts as a rebel, yeah. as a renegade, as a rogue, but he has nada, zip, zero, none, legitimate authority. None whatever. So he will take it. If you want to surrender it, he will take it by deception. But he has zero, zero legitimate authority. Rebellious authority only. We... we we come into a place where, let me put it this way, where we understand that we are an ecclesia which is far, 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 far more than the building a church where we gather together for a meeting. I don't mean this in any way uh, derogatory, critical of churches. I mean, I've been in a lot of different churches, a lot of different places and so on. But the majority of churches gather together in a meeting place, sing two or three songs, listen to a message being preached, <laughs> listen to a message being preached, um, take up the offering and have a cup of tea and go home then come back the next week and do the same thing. And the week after, and the week after, and the month after, and the year after. Then kind of perhaps wonder why the voice of the Antichrist is far more militant, far more aggressive, far more demanding, and has, has far more impact in the city than the voice of righteousness. Well, we're sort of sitting around listening to our favourite preachers, having a cup of tea, and anyway, enough of that, praise God. So, so we, we, we must understand what the Ecclesia is. Understand that we have a voice. Our voice can move mountains. Our voice has the power of life and death. We need to start holding a few things and a few people and a few organisations to account, which is the function of the Ecclesia. We need to understand that it is under a covenant of grace and that as the word of grace comes forth, then the power of the spirit manifested in signs, wonders and miracles comes upon the word of his grace. Within that same context, Ephesians 6.12 says that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers and rulers of darkness. There are literally, I would think, I mean, I have no idea of the number, but there would probably be tens of millions of demons, foot soldiers, lower ranking demons and whatever. But Ephesians 6.12 gives us three overarching or hierarchy, demonic hierarchies. Rulers of darkness, powers, 
and principalities. Now, each one of those has a different motivation. And, and we need to understand not only our covenant of grace, and we are in grace with the one who has catastrophically defeated all of these powers, so we need to walk in his victory, not try to invent our own. But all authority that is exercised by them is rebellious and they have zero authority, zero legitimate authority, but each has a different intent, purpose and motivation. If we sort of understand their motivation and what their intended purpose is, it gives us a little bit better idea, I think, of how to deal with them. So 612 makes it plain that we're engaged with a battle with a spiritual power that's motivated towards destroying all things godly. Families, churches, prayer, conservative moral values, and any sort of a voice for biblical values. It is intent on shutting it down, destroying it, and maligning it at every opportunity. We come to a point of understanding the motivation and purpose and bring them down. I think the greatest challenge I've, I've seen in churches over like the last 30 years, and th this has been a lot of prayer meetings, believers constantly pray to change the situation on the ground. Let me say this carefully. Believers put a lot of energy and a lot of time into prayer to change the circumstances on the ground, but never deal with the root causes in the atmosphere. A lot of prayer, a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of faith into changing what's on the ground, but never take control of the atmosphere. In past wars, First World War, certainly Second World War, probably Vietnam, Korea and so on, and, and certainly into the Gulf Wars and whatever. Whoever controlled the air war, whoever controlled the skies, had a massive advantage on the ground. It's no different in the spirit. If you're trying to bang your head against the result and bang your head against a rock and, you know, trying to make some headway on the ground, but you're not dealing with that controlling spirits in the atmosphere, you're struggling to get any sort of a decent outcome. There was a, a situation, this was, um, I was only about 11 years old, and I, I don't know why I, this sort of got etched into my memory and um, has stuck with me ever since, even though it was a bit meaningless at the time. I grew up out in the country, out way out in the far southwest of Queensland. On this particular property, we were about 50 miles out of town. On this particular property, we, we were having a mosquito problem. And n not massively so, but you know, you're always trying to slap a mosquito, particularly around dusk and night and so on. And, and you know, you, you'd burn a mosquito coil or something in those days and that didn't have a heck of a lot of effect, but, you know, you're always just slapping at the odd mosquito. I went outside past a shed uh, during the day and there was a 44-gallon drum, which I think in current measurements 200 litres or something, there's a 44-gallon drum of water there and I looked at it, it was almost full of water, and there was literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of mosquito larva on top of this water. And they actually, is, I mean, I don't know too much about them, but I, I think they actually have uh, like a, what it was just poking through the surface of the water. So they're principally underwater, but they're still breathing oxygen. I went and got uh, some kerosene and tipped it on the water which put a greasy film on top of the water, which within a matter of minutes killed all the mosquito larva, uh, end of mosquitoes. Um, we need to adopt the same practice spiritually. 
because we can spend all our lives slapping at irritating demons on the ground, but unless we start dealing with root causes, you know, we may or may not have a particularly significant impact on, on, on the city. Jesus dealt with root causes. In the storm in the Sea of Galilee, he rebuked the waves, or sorry, he spoke to the waves, but rebuked the wind. Because had he not rebuked the wind, uh, there would have been peace for 10 minutes until the wind blew up another set of waves, and he could have kept speaking to the waves for the rest of the night and day and whatever, but unless he rebuked the wind, which is the root cause, then all, he, he would have spent all day, all night, and the rest of the week maybe, speaking to waves. So Jesus rebuked the condition, but, sorry, spoke to the condition, but rebuked the root cause. So he dealt with both cause and effect. So when we see stuff happening on the ground, and situations and circumstances and prevailing, you know, crime and issues and, you know, whatever the case may be, on the ground, and we start praying into that, we can be speaking to the condition, but not rebuking the root cause. So we need to deal with cause and effect. In the valley of... Uh, Rephaim, David did a similar thing. On, on the instructions of the Lord, he went out and attacked them with the edge of the sword, but he burnt their gods. As they ran, left their gods behind, burnt them. So he's dealing with, it gives us again an example of dealing with cause and effect. The history of the Old Testament gives us Templates about dealing with various levels of demonic power in the New Testament. We do spiritually what they did naturally. So, an example in uh, Kenya and Uganda, uh, not last year, the year before, we had two two examples which surprised me, shocked me a bit because I'd never encountered this before. Um, we we're on uh, Lake Victoria in Kenya and uh, had, had blown the shofar and prayed on the edge of the lake. One of the pastors that we were with said his grandfather, who had um, led his family to the Lord, had prophesied that one day somebody would come and deal with the water spirits in the lake. So we had, we had prayed, blown the shofar and done a bit of stuff on the edge of the lake. Later that afternoon, that was, that was about one or two o'clock in the afternoon, Later that afternoon, about 5.36, we're having a, an open air meeting. Not many people there, probably 12, 14, 18 people there. And uh, we're just, I mean, really it was, seemed to be nothing of any significance. Um, we're just gathered in the front yard of a house and back behind us about maybe 800 metres or a kilometre, there was a range uh, of hills, maybe a ridge line of hills, that were maybe four or 500 feet high. And then on the other side was Lake Victoria. How many people here have seen the movie Zulu? How many? <laughs> Zulu, Michael Caine and Stanley Baker from about 1966 or something. Anyway, whatever. If you haven't seen it, I won't use the example. It doesn't matter. <laughs> um, but I, as we were preparing to start this meeting, I went, what? and looked around and there's literally hundreds, I don't know, maybe thousands. It was more not seeing with the natural eye but the impression and knowing they were there, demons coming up over this ridge from Lake Victoria where we were earlier in the afternoon. Took me by surprise, I wasn't expecting it. Um, didn't quite know what to do. Uh, we just started blowing the chauffeur, praying in the spirit. Seemed like a good idea at the time. Blew the shofar, prayed in the spirit, 
And these hundreds, maybe thousands, that are like boiling up over this hill went, yeah, no. Nah. Went back. And that was the end of that. A couple of weeks later, we're in Uganda, uh, in Kampala, uh, in a church car park. We just got out of the car, walking across the church car park, um, which we had probably from here to the back wall to go to the front door of the church. Got halfway, the same thing. There's a ridge line down one area and, and they're just boiling up over the ridge line. And we just started, I've never blown the shofar in a church car park before in my life. We started blowing the shofar in the church car park. And as we blew the shofar, I mean, it was really, and none of this is like with the naked eye, but you just knew and sensed it in the spirit. As we're blowing the shofar, these hordes of demons are coming in from one end and the angelic host came in from the other end. And we're standing, Gwyn and I standing in the middle. We went, oh yeah. <laughs> and, and again, the, this demonic horde went, yeah, no, nah, and, and went back. But my, my question, I sort of came home and thought, well, hang on, if it works in Africa, why not? Why not here? We deal with principalities, powers, and rulers of darkness. In, I think, I, this has been mentioned at home meetings. Um, in, I, I think here, yeah, I'm not sure. Going back maybe pushing 30 years ago, there was four VHS tapes were going around churches called Transformations. And those tapes, one was in Africa, uh, one was in Mexico, one was in California, and I can't think of the other one. But in each case, you know, people had been praying, there were churches in the area, and, and you know, stuff had been going on with, you know, people praying and fasting and, you know, whatever for, you know, but nevertheless, the pubs were still full, domestic violence was rife, drug addiction, witchcraft and whatever, despite the presence of the churches, was still going on at a very great rate of knots. Until one pastor, and the same had happened in each of these locations, dealt with the control of the territorial spirit and ripped the territorial spirit out of the atmosphere. And that's why it was called transformations. In the African one, which I sort of remember, he said, Lord, this witch and the demons that possess her are controlling, dominating and manipulating this town, causing every kind of wickedness, every kind of vileness, every kind of violence. She has two options. Get saved or get out of town. Three days later, she was gone, and the entire town got saved. The pubs are emptied, and everything changed. Hence the title, Transformations. In Mexico, this town, rural town in Mexico, jails were full and overflowing, drunkenness, domestic violence, unproductive farms, and so on. They did the same thing. The jails were emptied. Crime virtually stopped. Farms became incredibly productive where they are now not only producing enough for themselves, but they were sending truckloads of massive sized vegetables uh, to other towns and cities because the territorial spirit had been taken down and dealt with. When we understand principalities, powers and rulers of darkness, rulers of darkness are territorial spirits. So a territorial spirit, its purpose and its motive is simply to dominate and control what happens in that territory or location and to oppose the gospel and in particular, any manifestation of the power of the gospel. So a territorial spirit controls and dominates in an antichrist way 
a local geographical area. Powers are different, totally different. Powers, the best example of it scripturally, is Gideon and the Midianites. So where you see powers, and this is particularly evident in places like India, Pakistan, Africa, and so on. Gideon and the people are praying, and, and God says, look, I told you, when you came into the land that I give you, do not compromise with the false gods, with the gods of the Ammonites and so on, but, but you haven't listened. So in other words, powers, and, and it says there, and Israel was greatly impoverished because of this. So what a power does, principal, uh, sorry, rulers of darkness, territorial spirits, control local areas. Powers are motivated by stripping the people of resources and stripping the church of resources. And powers are usually linked to the worship of false gods. So particularly when you're in places like India, Africa, Pakistan and so on, abject poverty, the people and the government and the churches stripped of any resources, always looking for some sort of handout or support, stripped of resources and the entire nation is riddled with witchcraft and the worship of false gods. Principality is different again. Principality comes from a Greek word meaning first in line. Sometimes the word is mistakenly used, in my opinion for whatever it's worth, you know, the, the principality over Sydney or the principality over this whatever. Um, not an entirely accurate understanding of it. Principality means first in line numero uno. So there is only one principality and that is the prince demon over the nation. The rest are subordinate to that. So when Daniel was praying, he said, uh, the angel came and said, well, from the first day you prayed, you, your prayer was heard, but the prince of Persia withstood me for 21 days. We're talking about a demonic prince, not, not a natural prince. And when I go, the prince of Greece will come. So the principality is the prince demon over the nation. The motivation of a principality is always to rob the people and rob the nation of its true destiny. That's what Pharaoh was trying to do of Israel. Rob it, keep it oppressed, and rob it of its destiny. So let's look at that again. Territorial spirit, control and manipulate the territory. Ruler of darkness. Powers, strip the nation and strip the people and strip the church of resources, usually associated with the worship of strange gods. Principality, rob the, oppress the nation and rob the nation of its true destiny. How do you deal with them? Ruler of darkness, a territorial spirit, Goliath, dealt with by a covenant relationship. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine? He is immediately saying, because circumcision is the seal of the Abrahamic covenant. And it was the Abrahamic covenant that gave Israel the legitimate right to possess the land. What he's saying is this big buffhead has no, none, nada, zip, legitimate authority. He's making a lot of noise He's got a loud voice, which is terrifying everyone, but behind the loud voice, there is no legitimate authority whatsoever. Might I humbly submit that there are any number of minority groups motivated by territorial spirits with very loud voices that everyone is backing off from, but they have no legitimate authority because Jesus has it all and has invested it in the Ecclesia. 
if the ecclesia will just rise up and use its voice and understand its position in the covenant of grace. Powers, totally different ballpark. Before Gideon ever, ever won the physical battle, he had to break down the altars, deal with the altars and the strongholds, won the spiritual victory before he ever engaged in any physical victory. Most of the time that message is where I've heard it preached, you know, from Gideon's magnificent victory with 300 when he started with 32,000. But the real victory was won by breaking down the altars, cutting down the Asherah poles. That's, that's where the victory was won. So territorial spirit dealt with by a covenant relationship, understanding it has no legitimate authority, whatever. Powers, you gotta deal with the altars and the strongholds first. Principalities are always dealt with by the blood. The blood's on the doorpost and the lintel. So you can't deal with the principality with a covenant relationship. The principality's gotta be dealt with by the blood. Powers, you've got to deal with the altars and the strongholds. The rule of darkness, you can deal with with a covenant relationship. In each of those cases, we don't go off just saying, well, you know, let, let's just presumptuously go in here and start ripping into things and tearing into things and whatever. Still, it's not a bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really sorely tempted at times. However, I felt like I was doing that in Africa. Uh, yeah, well, and I wound up sick as the dog in Africa, but anyway, that was a different story, a different story entirely. I, um, there was a young, I think I told you the story, and I'll finish with this. I, um, I've been in a northern city, Gulu. Uh, which is the second time I've been there. I was starting a, a Bible study, and as, as this, as we just prayed, opening the meeting, this young girl, 20, 21 or two, um, just over, just literally fell out of a chair, just dropped on the floor, and I was really tired. It was at the end of six weeks. I went, what, what, what's going on there? And I walked over, caught, got caught totally off guard, which was stupid, my my fault entirely. But um, she, she was completely possessed. But over a period of um, the next two or three days, she was completely released. Um, and, and seeing her face and seeing her three meetings later to where she was on the floor. Because on the floor I walked over and she looked up at me and her eyes were totally rolled back in her head and her eyes were just white. There was no pupils, no nothing, it was just white. And as she looked up at me, there's these two white eyes looking at me and so her head rolled over and this oily black, horrible stuff just came out of her mouth on the floor. So from where she was to where she was with a smile on her face completely free three days later. Um, I sort of, yeah, I wound up paying a bit of a price for it. But I thought, you know what, uh, if being a bit sick, um, it was a price, uh, I'd do it again in a heartbeat. So, praise God. We don't go into stuff presumptuously. That's where the king priest prayer comes in. David, in the valley of Rephaim, said, Lord, hear them Philistines come. Will I do this? Will I do that? Yes, go. So he's prayed as a priest gotten a strategy from God, then stepped out and enforced it as a king. Then they came back and once again, rather than presumptuously doing the same thing that worked last week, he prayed again and said, Lord, they're back. What will I do? This time wait until you hear the sound of going to the tops of the mulberry trees. So same enemy, same place, but no presumptuousness. Different strategy, even though it's the same enemy in the same place, a different strategy. So it says we wrestle. It doesn't say wrestling is an option. It doesn't say, look, um, 
think, think about wrestling and look, if you feel up to it next Friday, would you have a crack? No, it says, we wrestle, there is no option, and you've only got to watch the news, watch the media and so on, and we are in a war, whether you like it or not. But the ecclesia needs to be an ecclesia. It needs to be at least as militant, if not more militant, than the powers of darkness, because they will tear you to shreds at any opportunity they get. But they do so from a rebellious authority and without a covenant. So we stand in the covenant of grace, which is backed by signs and wonders and miracles, and we pray with heavenly strategy and a voice. Because in the end, the voice that we speak with is backed by the government of heaven as we are ambassadors of the yoke that destroys the enemy, of the anointing that destroys the yoke of the enemy.